go. Simon, wife on. Welcome to Hey Chower. Glad we could line us up. I think we've been trying, Simon, for three, trying for the podcast. For three <laughs> years. <laughs> for like three, we've been trying for years, yeah, yeah. you. I, I, I can't for believe three, you'd start three with that. Three years, I think, is it? I mean, gotta be three years. I think so, yeah, three yeah. Years, it's yeah. been a while. Yeah, uh, yeah, mm. but here we are. I won't, I won't, I won't labour the point. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. It's hard. Hey. You can be, uh, yeah, yeah. No, I'm going to get hold of sometimes. Yeah, yeah, it's just superb. Um, no, a pleasure to have you here. Great, um, thanks. Thank Good you. to be here. Yeah, and to be honest, you're part of a group of fascinating people that I've been introduced to initially through Keith Abram, for which I'm eternally grateful. Mm. Um, Good Keith. Yeah, and uh, and today, obviously, we're going to talk about ayahuasca, mm, predominantly, yeah. if not exclusively, mm. which is, I think, is sort of the biggest black <coughs> hole in my knowledge I have when it comes to my early journey on the knowledge of psychedelics. Awesome. Um, so uh, I'm really looking forward to this. Great. Um, you guys are both behind on air science which mm -hmm. is ayahuasca research right but yeah, before yeah. we get to how you came to be involved in the company together mm. how did you meet in the first place what brought you to spirits together yeah sure so um <clears throat> we met at king's college london so we were both working um in child and adolescent uh, mental health working with severe autism and adhd <clears throat> and I'm a psychiatrist by background uh, and I was new to the team uh, and Waifong was there working as a psychologist and I think within the first day <clears throat> we started talking about ayahuasca research because <laughs> I'd already been doing it for a few years beforehand in fact that's the reason that I moved down to London was to continue doing the research um, here, um, it's based in the jungle, but also just being based at one of the top universities in uh, in London, and uh, yeah, you were pretty much immediately on board. Yeah, yeah. So, had you already been researching it as well? No, well, I I knew about it. Um, I used to work in addiction a lot, especially, and I, also I'm a musician, and within the musical scenes, uh, it's quite it's quite commonplace uh, being around everywhere. And then when I worked in addiction, there wasn't, you know. It wasn't like a, a classic drug of addiction that, that, that people mostly knew about, like alcohol, crack, cocaine, heroin. Um, and then, yeah, no one really knew about the psychedelics or the club drugs like ketamine, MDMA, but um, I had an expertise in that. So I developed trainings to train the staff that were on the drug and alcohol teams there. So I had been doing my own research, going to conferences and stuff like that before meeting Simon. Okay. Mm -mm -mm. Uh so where did it go from there then? You met each other, you had the mutual interest in ayahuasca. Yeah. And then did he recruit you? <laughs> <laughs> did he like... Does he drag me into it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you could kind of phrase it like that. I guess we, we just got funding um, <clears throat> from the UK government, from the Medical Research Council, which is the first time that the Medical Research Council had funded any research into ayahuasca. And as far as I'm aware, it's still the only time. And we had that funding <clears throat> and we were about to go out into the jungle uh, to do this new study, looking at the effects of ayahuasca on epigenetic change. Um, and epigenetics is, it's really cool. It's the, the study um, of the way that the environment um, affects the expression of different genes. So rather than actually changing your DNA, like your genetic codes, <clears throat> it's the genes that are expressed. So for example, when you say the environment, yeah, yeah, you mean external environment or the environment in the brain? Well, both, both. Yeah. And so, so we were specifically looking at childhood trauma uh, in this first study. But epigenetics, anything can affect epigenetics. So, <clears throat> so for example, uh, the quality of air, your your diet, things like that. Whether you smoke, it changes the expression of your genes. Um, but more recently, we started looking at whether or not um, military veterans um, who have suffered from PTSD, um, have epigenetic change as a result of drinking ayahuasca and going on one of these retreats. Mm. Um, yeah, and specifically looking at whether or not genes associated with trauma can almost be reversed. So if you experience a big trauma, so for example, you're in some kind of combat situation, then you might have certain genes that have been cranked up as a result of that. Like an obvious one would be cortisol, so like a stress hormone. And that's appropriate if you're in a combat situation, <clears throat> but when you get back to civilian life, 
you don't want your gene the you know there are many genes that, that are associated with cortisol but you don't want those to be super sensitive and releasing lots of cortisol it's inappropriate and it makes it difficult to, to survive in the world so our hypothesis is that by drinking ayahuasca we're looking to see whether or not some of those genes could be reversed so that's that's what we're looking at mm. and um yeah, so we, we just started looking at epigenetics in this first study, um, and we started uh, speaking about the study, and Wai Feng, with his background in psychology, was a, a really welcome addition to the team. I think, uh, yeah, you were helping, helping to design that study within about a week, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, was, it, was such a, it was such an interesting field for me before even getting into it. Like I've, I, I, I was more well-versed than the other psychedelics. I think ayahuasca is generally like... A, uh, a gap for a lot of people because it's not one of those classic like LSD or, or psilocybin mushroom, which is more commonplace around, especially in kind of Western society. Whereas ayahuasca, a lot of the time, people would have to go all the way to to South yes, America. Yes, question of accessibility, right? Exactly. Is that it mainly? Yeah, like who can like who and who has the training and the qualifications, well, not qualifications, but like the expertise to be able to guide something like ayahuasca because of the way it's formatted is really quite different to other psychedelics and other psychedelic trips and especially with the purge and it can you know can get quite intense not that other psychedelics don't have that capacity as well but especially with ayahuasca there's a really rich tradition and ceremony and ritual around it as well um so yeah i was really excited to to learn more about it and jump on board with this research especially taking a lead on the psychological side um to complement the epigenetics and uh i to, yeah, to this day, I'm still very interested in all the biological stuff. And I think it's so important to look at it holistically and especially from a genetic side, it, it's, it's quite transdiagnostic, you know. So these markers people have and it will cover many conditions and t tell us a lot about these mechanisms that are underlying some of the changes that we're seeing before and after and following them up over long periods of time. Um, that first study, we were looking at specifically one gene, looking at the sigma-1, which is a gene that plays a large role in memory encoding and how memory retrieval happens in the brain, uh, which is a big component of PTSD and trauma, right? But that was primarily in healthy participants. And then luckily, this time round, because being able to get a bit more funding and a bigger team, access to labs, it's been a few years since that first study now, uh, we are able to expand to a larger section, section of the human genome and look through that. Sorry, so that study was looking at the, the impact of ayahuasca on healthy brains memory capability, basically. Is that correct? Not really memory. <clears throat> so we were looking at uh, three different genes and we found an effect in one of them in the in the sigma one gene and that gene does lots of different things <clears throat> so why and one of the things that it does <clears throat> is it changes um it's hypothesized to be involved in traumatic memory recall um, and so the idea is is that if you change the regulation of that gene it becomes easier to access traumatic memories so you can bring them to the surface and then you can begin to work through them um, within the ceremony um, and arguably after afterwards as well, like when you're doing your, your integration. And we were specifically looking at that because we, our funding had to be focused on childhood trauma. So we were looking at whether or not there was a correlation between changes that we saw in depression and anxiety, common mental health conditions, um, and the amount of childhood trauma that people had gone through, and then whether or not that related to the change in expression of this gene. And so what we found is there was a correlation. So we found that there was a change in the expression of this gene. We found that people drinking ayahuasca seemed to become less depressed and less anxious, and the people who have more childhood trauma had a, uh, a greater change in each of those things that we saw. So it seemed to be that ayahuasca was helping people with greater levels of childhood trauma, trauma more. But that study was it's more of a proof of concepts. And so it's with the results from that study suggested that we should be looking into this field more, that maybe the epigenetics, the expression, the changing expression of different genes has, it could be an underlying factor um, to the changes that we see as a result of ayahuasca. So that's why in our more recent studies, when we're looking at the military veterans, we've started looking at almost the entire human genome rather than just three genes, like a huge number of genes now. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's really, really groundbreaking. And in, and in more people, I think it's good to highlight here that first study is proof of concept because it was in quite a small number of people 
And when we do studies in genetics, we really require really big numbers into the hundreds, for example. Uh, that study was like 60 something, 60, 70 yeah, people. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now with more funding, we are able to yeah, look at a wider section of the genome and be able to um, yeah, look at more people and through yeah. heroic hearts and through people like Keith and yeah. Mm. yeah. yeah. So with the, with the improvement in that, or the easier access to the, to the traumatic memories, mm. did, and those other improvements that you mentioned that you, that you touched on in, in people and the subjects, subjects right to him, right? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, fine. Okay. That's um, was that improvement only while they were under the influence of the ayahuasca or was it a lasting effect? Yeah, it's a lasting effect. So, <clears throat> so we saw that these changes were most significant um, after, immediately afterwards, um, after the retreats. Um, but then we found at six months, they were still maintained, but they were be a lot of people, some people continued, so like um, levels of depression continued to improve even at the six month mark. But a lot of people began to go back to their baselines. So they would still be, according to our measures, less depressed or less anxious than they already, than they were to begin with. But they were beginning to come back again But by, by the time we got to the six month mark. And that's, that's relatively common with psychedelics in general. And <clears throat> you definitely come across some instances where people, you know, have one ayahuasca ceremony and it changes their life and then that's it. They never have to drink it again. But for the majority of people, at least in my experience, after a few months, people are normally saying, yeah, we need to have a bit of a top up. Why do you think that is? Do you think that, do you, I mean, because Keith is one of the people who's a one-off, right? Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I think Keith, I think Keith changed, I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I recall that Keith changed his lifestyle significantly after mm. that experience. Mm. Whereas other people may not have that opportunity. In right. integration they yeah. have that experience it has a big impact on them but they're in the same environment as mm -hmm. they were before yeah yeah, yeah? and sort of and you can slip back into the same mental routines mental ill health yeah um, bad uh, habits um I think is that correct to say yeah I mean it, it really depends and it's very case by case right and uh, we're still we're still learning about how these effects or the therapeutic potential of it can be more longer lasting, right? And, um, and I think a lot of it has to do with the quality of the integration and how well those lessons that you take from the ceremony, from your psychedelic experience can be generalized through everyday life and how much you actually you action and, and able to change your relationship with say like a traumatic memory or a very stressful part of yourself or something that's really maladaptive and not serving you anymore, right? Um, so yeah, people like Keith, I think, you know, someone who, yeah, from the way I know Keith, like he, uh, like his his expertise in Tai Chi and like Qi Gong and like just the good works he put in this and like his wonderful connections with his family, you know, that's really beautiful kind of integration work. And looking at, um, Looking at, I don't know, do the viewers know Keith, but um, the looking at pictures of before and after with Keith, he's just like this really, like really stern, proper macho guy with uh, with his gun, and then and then now like I was I was just talking to um, Hugh. Now like how I met Keith for the first time, I'd been working with him uh, initially um, online over lockdown because he's the he's the head of Heroic Arts UK, and then I went to. Margate one time because I was making music there and I was doing some Tai Chi on the beach and then some guy came up to me to compliment on my form and it was Keith <laughs> and I was like oh wow it's so good to finally meet you man <laughs> yeah yeah and just going back to that point as well why is that like why do why do people revert back again I think um one of the one of the biggest healing components of the ayahuasca retreat, aside from the, the actual ayahuasca itself, so pharmacologically, um, and arguably the spiritual component as well, which I'm sure we'll get to later, is the community component. So when you get people on an ayahuasca retreat, for the first time, but for a lot of people, <clears throat> They are with 10 other people who are in the same situation as them. Everyone's super open. Everyone, not always, but most of the time, everyone wants to talk. They want to help each other. Everyone's really supportive. So they're going through it together. There's this sense of camaraderie. And you have facilitators who are there just to speak to you the whole time. You're there as a participant for an extended state of time. 
And so when you finish that retreat, it depends where you go back to. So if you go back to a loving, supportive home, then I would imagine that those, you know, those changes are probably going to be better preserved. But, you know, for some of the veterans that we come across, and definitely like when I used to work in addictions as well, if you, if you help somebody from an addiction, great, they're clean, and then you send them back to the crack den that they live in, what, what do you think is going to happen? And, you know, and I think in my experience too, with a lot of the veterans that we work with, they're isolated. They're super isolated. They're like stuck somewhere with no money. There's isolation. They, like, they don't have um, their support network around them. And so if you take that support network away, even if they've done fantastic work, if that doesn't change, if those foundational things don't change in their lives, then of course that... You know, the, the rumination, the desperation, all of that stuff is going to come back again. Um, so I think you can't underestimate the social components of these retreats as well. Mm, it's, a really inter- it's really interesting that yeah, I've, got a, I've got a good friend and he's spoken about this at length um, uh, in relation to his brother. Yeah. And his brother is, you know, drug abuse and all of the, th- all of the bad things that go along with that, you know, criminal record. And, and he's been in and out in jail. And, and one of the things my friend says is like, they, they released him from jail. I'm a friend of mm. serving. So he can't be there to handhold him and babysit him, not babysit because he's young, but just try and keep him away from the bad stuff. But they release him from prison and he's right back into the same environment, exposed mm. to people who are going to take advantage of him, mm. from drugs to people who want him to go and nick stuff and all. It's, just, it's exactly the same thing. It's the same problem, right? Interesting yeah. also about the, the environment you're talking about. Mm. Um, and we're I talking mean, about people with like, many years of mental health problems you know and then the way these habitualized kind of like ways of being and thinking and interacting and relating with people and substances have been really long like many years of 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 these issues that are just like ingrained in their everyday lives so we're talking about really major shifts that people would have to I mean, like finding a new place to live, finding a new way of working, a new way of interacting with other people and really try and fix those relationships. A whole new community. Toxic people, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so has there been research into um, the, in, the effects of ayahuasca when it's been given, administered, experienced in a normal environment, hospital, doctor environment where you haven't got all that additional change of surroundings and your surroundings the shamanism the the uh, the ritualistic side has there been research on that on, on that yeah for sure there has been i mean there's been one major randomized control tra- trial which is that's the gold standard in hospitals and there were still really good really good effects as a result of that i mean a few things come to mind i mean it's there are some studies that break ayahuasca down to just the DMT and the homal alkaloids, where DMT is the main psychoactive component, the um, psychedelic component uh, within ayahuasca, and homal alkaloids. Um, they have their own method, their own um, their own individual things that they do. They're a type of antidepressant, but they also work to prevent the DMT from being broken down so that it's absorbed into the bloodstream. But there are studies that look at those two things um, individually or in tablet form without any of the the shamanic singing or whatever, and they still find positive results. But I kind of feel with that, yeah, that that makes sense. But arguably, that's not ayahuasca um, when you break it down like that. But I also think that you're really missing a core component when you do that. Um, and when you have that, it? yeah, it's super reductionist. And when you have that, um, when you include the shamanic component, when you include that container, that's arguably, arguably being developed over hundreds, if not thousands of years, I, I feel that the results are just so much stronger. And although the studies still show that the results for both are good, I do question whether our measures can actually capture all the benefits that happen within that shamanic container in the jungle so let me give you an example right so we'll be in the jungle and very simply you can split research into quantitative and qualitative quantitative is numbers qualitative is set like interviews and you can analyze data like through that and when we do quantitative quantitative uh, research like well, Fung and i will stand up and we'll give talks and we'll say oh yeah like depression decreased by over 50 percent but that i mean it's true it's like it's not a lie but that's like a fragment of what actually happened and you capture more with with qualitative but there's even more that's going on there and there's things things to do with your you know 
potentially spiritual healing, your change in perception of the world. And there's only so much I feel that we can truly capture um, through the measures that we use in Western, Western scientific research. Yeah. And like, I just also think what's happening out there is we're, we're lacking where science is at right now. We're just lacking in the tools to be able to capture those things. And we're talking like people are coming back with, you know, really visionary anecdotes of really metaphysical experiences, our body experiences, reliving past lives, you know, and all these really ineffable ex <laughs> uh, dreamlike um, accounts of uh, it's really rich in detail and and those sorts of things is like how do you capture that how do you quantify that how do you try to measure that in a way that does it justice for for us to learn about it um, and the best way we can do now is just do interviews with people uh, labor intensive that's the problem isn't it with the yeah. qualitative data they take it, yeah. it's talking to people or surveys it's got or a questionnaires rep. or interviews yeah. it just takes so, yeah, it's hard to generalize that over people when it's just like one yeah. case studies, right? It's got a bad, bad rep in science, like qualitative interviews. There's definitely really good ways to do it, but then yeah, the pushing power, especially when it comes to like law reform and stuff like that, is is weaker. Then that's one of the reasons why, <clears throat> just almost kind of strategically, as much as anything, as much as the research being interesting, we started. Bro like broadening our um, the scope of our research. So we started just using psychometric questionnaires. So our first studies were looking at the effects of ayahuasca on personality. And that was just using really long questionnaires that assess your personality before and afterwards. And so we saw, just very simply put, there were decreases in how neurotic participants were immediately after drinking ayahuasca. And that was maintained six months later. But it's quite easy to... To, to fault that and as Feng said it doesn't carry that much weight in the scientific community and the gold standard is usually the uh, randomized control trial and obviously we're doing all of our research in the Amazon rainforest so we thought how can we bring more weight to this so it's taken more seriously it's already quite far out like like literally and metaphorically like, like <laughs> working, working, working with ayahuasca only with shamans um, and you know trying to capture what it is that they're doing and so that's why we started looking at genetics like you can't argue with genetics like genetics neuroimaging so we're using eeg as well so we're placing eeg caps they're like little rugby caps on participants uh, before they have their ceremony and then afterwards as well in the hotel in Iquitos, uh, and looking at the changes in brain waves that, that, that happens because of that and then also most recently collecting small samples of poo to look at changes in the gut microbiome before and after and with that kind of science you know it's mm. much harder to say well you know it could have been like due to placebo or whatever if it's a genetic change so that's another reason we're looking at it so mm. there's is he, are you insinuating there, or is the insinuation that there's long-term impact on the gut biome as well? Positive impact? For sure. Really? I mean, <laughs> we haven't analysed the results yet, so we don't know. So this is oh. these are the new studies that we're doing uh, with, with Heroic Hearts and with the Herb Clinic. Um, yeah, I mean... We hypothesize that there will be because, well, there's definitely going to be a change. Whether or not it will be beneficial, I'm not sure. The reason we think there's going to be a change is, I don't know if anyone listens to this as drunk ayahuasca, but it just makes you vomit and gives you diarrhea the whole time. And then every other plant treatment the Shipibos use, which is the indigenous community that we work with, just seems to make you vomit. In fact, that seems to be the answer to everything. It's just like, <laughs> hey, make you vomit and give you diarrhea. You've got relationship issues? Here, have some diarrhea. <laughs> Um, so I imagine that it would change the gut microbiome. Um, so yeah. Why is that but, important? But also like every, I mean, now there's a lot of research coming out looking at neurology and like looking at receptors and, and things that regulate your mood and your brain and how much of that is actually found in the gut, in the gut brain axis, the relationship between the two. So changes, if we're seeing such significant changes in people's mood or uh, mental health presentation and like that's long, la longer lasting compared to say, um, Western pharmaceuticals, um, we're bound to, you know, see a relationship with the gut. But then, yeah, like Simon said, with ayahuasca, it has that additional vomiting, kind of purging, which uh, which things like LSD or mushrooms are, you know, not known to have. Um, so yeah, we're quite. It looks like a really good direction to go down with this research, and we've got a really good expert on 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 that hand. Why, why is the why is the 
the gut biome important for mental health and psycho- psychological health? Well, the body and the mind is so intrinsically connected. And this is something that's very, um, the people in the jungle, they know this very well, you know, like, uh, yeah, they were saying how- so I know there's a link. I know there's a link. I know that a healthy gut biome I mean, does impact the health of your health of you mentally. It doesn't impact it, right? I just don't understand why the mechanics of it are any level deeper than what I just explained. So if you can help <laughs> me with that, I would appreciate it. <laughs> with a gut microbiome. Uh, so we, <laughs> I, I wouldn't be able to go into this as, as deep as uh, the expert on my field, but uh, to my understanding with the gut, there's a lot of our neurotransmitters, for example, um, things like serotonin, dopamine, we actually find a lot of that in the gut and is stored in there. It's actually like a second brain. So a lot of the a lot of the way we make decisions, we're finding out more is not just held in the mind and not just held in the brain. It's actually a lot of it is dictated by our bodies. And when our bodies feel a certain way or is fed a certain way or is clean, not clean, that affects everything. Our whole, whole decision making, the way we feel, the way we relate to things. Um, Hence gut feelings. Yeah. And then even more than that, so we have the the microbiota, the makeup, make up the gut, but then they also release things. So they release different chemicals and then they flood around our system as well. And then they it's go up to our neurotransmitters, brain. right? Yeah, 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 all sorts of things. And so it's, yeah, it is, it's intrinsically interlinked. And some indigenous communities, they don't even make a um, distinction between the brain and the body or the mind and the body. It's all just, it's all just one thing. Um, but yeah, we'll get back to you the next time we're on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can't wait to see that day. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating. Um, I was thinking about, uh, I, I, I felt like I asked a stupid question earlier. It's like, hey, you know, not a stupid question. I was, when I asked about, the research and of the impact of ayahuasca in a, a clinical setting. Mm. Mm. Um, but it seems so obvious now to me when thinking going on that, you know, if, if you change your environment, do whatever you're doing, you know, you can be listening to music now in here and then go and listen to the same music. I don't know, stood on your own in the middle of the Albert Hall, still in your headphones, but you're in the middle of the Albert Hall and you're looking around, you're going to experience the music in a different thing. It's kind of yeah. the same, isn't it? And, uh, and, um, and that's been my experience with, with the psychedelics as well. So mm. it's, it's pretty obvious. Again, back to your point, it's just about accessibility, right? Mm. Um, mm. With the ritualistic side of it. The um, are you able to, how, how do you, is there much information and learning you're able to pull in that qualitative research aspect from the shamans and those uh, communities themselves? Is that difficult? Yeah, I mean, you could do a study uh, interviewing the shamans and getting their and getting their opinion. Um, they seem to all say slightly different things as to their explanation of what's going on. So that could be slightly problematic. I think the kind of the closest thing that that we do to that at the moment is um, it's really important for us to include the indigenous shamans that we work with uh, at every stage of the research that we're doing. And so we have something called the Indigenous Advisory Board, which is basically the uh, Shipibos of the indigenous curanderos who we work with, um, as well as some other non-indigenous curanderos who have also trained um, with, with the, those that we work with. And whenever we get funding, we sit down with them and we say, look, like, what, are you, what do you want to study? And uh, the last time we did this, uh, Don Rono Lopez, who's, who's our shaman, said, I want to look at the, um, <laughs> the communication between human and plants. And I, we immediately thought, oh, shit. I'm immediately regretting this decision of setting up this advisory board. Um, and so we did it, though. We, we, we did a study um, looking at um, ayahuasca and nature relatedness, which is how you, your change in your perception to the plants uh, and nature in general changes over time. Mm. And so that's do you feel connected uh, you know, to the wider environment? Do you feel like you're part of the wider environment? Um, are you trying to protect it more? Or are you more ecological, ecologically aware? Things like that. And that was and, the first paper a, uh, an indigenous practitioner was a co-author. Mm. Yeah, oh, wow. Paper. And it's due to be published next month. Uh, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. Are you guys publishing that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 with Rono. But then, but then we also, after that, we, um, we tried to get their opinion on the results. And so this is really kind of where, it's not quite qualitative research, but it, it's definitely, I think it's really valid. 
we get our results and then we run it past people like Renault and we get their opinion because that changes the interpretation of the results. And so for example, just going back to epigenetics, because this is it's quite a nice example. Um, so with epigenetics, we've already discussed that it's the effect of your environment on the expression of your genes. But that also, like according to the theory, which is you know, rapidly being proven that more studies are needed, but it seems to be this way, that that is passed down through generations. So there have been some studies, so for example, looking at survivors of the Holocaust, they have shown that certain genes have been passed down to children, and your children's children, and your children's children's children, and it seems that it's up to 13 generations in rat studies that those, that those genes get passed down. And that's kind of sobering when you think about uh, like your diet, like my diet is not just for me, you know, it, it's, that's going to change the genes that are expressed in my DNA, which will then be passed down to my kids and maybe even their kids and then maybe even their kids. And so anyway, so that was, that's what epigenetics is. And when we spoke to Don Rono about this and we're saying, yeah, we're looking at epigenetics and you know, trying to describe this to, to, to Rono. His response was to say, oh yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, not surprised at all. That's cleaning familial lines. I do that in ceremony all the time. You know, that's ancestral trauma. I clean your familial lines like you never thank me. So I didn't know you were doing that, but um, I've been doing that for ages. <laughs> like, yeah. um, and so that's, when we speak to the Kurundaras like that, that's their interpretation. And that maps on quite nicely to science. That seems to overlap. One sec. What's mm. the relevance of the Holocaust in that story? Sorry, I didn't get it. <laughs> so, so, you, so you mentioned the Holocaust as like an event. Yeah, and then yeah, yeah. The on the, the, what's been, so what is so the behavior being passed on? So that was a study that looked at whether or not certain genes from survivors of the Holocaust have been passed down through generations. Ah. So okay. again. Intergenerational trauma. Yeah. yeah. So again, obviously, but, uh, right. Holocaust so extremely changes stressful. changes in the genes caused by the trauma was passed yeah. down. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I exactly. See. I apologize. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, no, no. We're good. Always good to, to clarify yeah. stuff like that. So, so that could be the same for anyone who has a significant changes to them because of trauma, like PTSD sufferers, for example. Exactly. Epigenetic changes. For sure. And their mm -hmm. children, children's yeah. children, children's mm -hmm. children, children. children could be impacted by that trauma they never experienced themselves. For sure, absolutely, huh. absolutely. I mean, that makes sense to me. That I mean, that makes sense to me when you think, oh, well, uh, for, for a child, oh, well, obviously, because they'll have known that person mm -hmm. and be impacted by, like, be impacted by it, not in a genetic way, but a behavior, like, uh, what's the word? Yeah, a behavioral way. Yeah, and like, psychologically, um, if you're around somebody who's depressed, like, if you have a depressed think. parent, then that's going to have an impact on you. But it seems like maybe that could be happening on a genetic level as well. I guess it's also good to highlight here, <laughs> like, scare viewers, like, with, with, with genetics. And, uh, like every gene needs uh, an environment to express itself, you know, <clears throat> and it can be passed down, sure. But then there's also things that we can do to help heal ourselves, help heal, heal these intergenerational traumas. I mean, why we're looking at psychedelics is because we believe that has potential, but there's many things that can help heal intergenerational trauma that might be passed down for you and to you. And as we understand with the field of epigenetics, everything we do in our lifetimes, what we surround ourselves with, the environment, the community, everything changes how the gene expresses itself and recodes, and that will then mm. be passed down to, to the next generation. Yeah, that ge those genetics that get passed on. I, that I read a book, but you you will know this guy or know this guy. You may know him, Robert Plowman. Yeah, Robert yeah. Robert Plowman he wrote a book yeah. called Blueprint. It was quite controversial yeah. at the time. We got I say controversial. Controversial by morons who did it, like they misinterpret or misrepresent what he was saying. But it was a book. Have you read that? Book? I haven't read it now, but I know about what the it. impact of genetics on yeah. you know on a person and what the probability of certain of them developing certain behaviours or illnesses or X, Y, or Z trait is in their life based up at the point they're born. You know, before they're influenced by the environment, and um, and I didn't realise how big an impact that sort of. The genetics were you, you you want i think as a as a layman you think genetics oh yeah i'll, I'll probably have blue eyes because or i'll have ginger hair because my parents mm. are ginger or mm. i may uh, i may be tall or this body type or this athletic ability because x y or z but obviously it goes deeper than that as you're as you were saying now and to, to, to have the trauma passed on like that i mean mm. does it is it more complex than simply um uh person has really deep rooted, rooted anxiety as a symptom of a trauma because they're ill and so that's likely to be passed on I have a more anxious 
child, for example, or is it more can it be uh, more complex and that and less obvious? Well, yeah, it depend, depends on the environment the child's brought up in. If if, if the parent, before, well, when passing that um, gene on to the child, uh, is still very anxious about that thing and it comes across with their parenting and their, their parenthood and then surrounds the child with like overprotectiveness, overbearingness, then it's likely to, <laughs> likely to, the child is likely to be also influenced and impacted by it, by that. And I think the the, the gene that's most um, that that's most most likely passed down for the for the child to also pick up traits on that is actually alcoholism. Yeah, yeah. More so than like autism or like ADHD. But with all these things, it's so multifactorial. So there's not one gene for alcoholism, you know, and there's not one gene for anxiety. Like there are so many, there are like loads and loads and so many factors. And so it's, it's, not, it's not the case that if you have a parent with anxiety, oh my God, the anxiety gene is going to be passed down to the child. Like it's, it's, it's really not like that at all. It's there are firstly all of those different genes. And then there are, there are so many cases as well where you see people who come from a horrendous background and they're just totally put together and they're fine. You're like, yeah. wow, you turned out great. Yeah. You get the same in the military. Yeah. yeah. You can have one person who experienced some things and be ruined by it. Yeah. And you can have mm. other people who are exactly uh, who, who experienced horrendous things repeatedly mm. and be totally fine. Be totally yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. There was a, uh, but yeah, yeah. I won't, I won't labour on that point, but yeah, it's, it makes sense. I was going to say to you, the alcoholism. Like I, I get with the alcoholism. It's rife in my family. Rife mm. up and down the generations on my on my father's side. Rife, mm. and yet it's not elsewhere. And I think that it has to be. I can't see any other reason. Yeah. It has to be like <laughs> it's like pure genetics. I hate the fact it exists. Uh, like, and it's so ingrained in the culture, right? Or cut the culture of where drinking is happening. Irish and Scottish found uh, heritage as well. <laughs> that'll do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And just yeah, that, just it. to highlight that. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And and this is. Like that's where the re that's what the research is showing right now, and the research will always be uh, as as at this moment in time be um, within that Western paradigm way of researching, and when we're looking at these uh, mental health conditions that people are presenting with, their genetic profiles are very varied. <laughs> you know, there there's very hard to find unless it's like a deletion syndrome, like Down syndrome or something. It's very hard to find a specific thing that is passed down. So yeah, it's very multifactorial. Um, mm. So how do you how do you go and select which genes you want to focus on? You talked about sigma one, was it? Mm -hmm. Which was mm -hmm. uh, yeah, sigma one. How, how, are you going to maintain focus on that, or if not, are you going to switch to focus on something else? How does how does it work? Well, so why, why are you going to choose what you're going to choose? To begin with, basically, we wanted to uh, we wanted to demonstrate that it was worth looking at. Yeah. So we proof chose. Of yeah, exactly. The proof of concept. So we chose the genes that we were like, if if this doesn't affect it nothing will um so the chances of it not being affected no, we're going to be so slim and so now we're just casting the net really really wide to try and look at as many genes as possible to see what those what those changes are so to begin with it was based on literature um whereas now it's just kind of yeah just try and capture as many genes as possible so how do you do that capture as many genes as possible yeah uh, you get more funding and then you and then you look at uh, uh are the better techniques that allow you to to look at more genes so you, you would that mean you would have to is it you would uh study before study the subject before the administration of ayahuasca get a baseline for yeah. all of them yeah exactly yeah in the range of genes you think you are going to be able to measure or want to measure or, yeah. or assess analyze well, We've been just collecting saliva samples, uh, and then you can, and then so you have their saliva. Or now we're moving to blood, like kind of like dried blood spots. Um, and so, yeah, you just get some biological material, uh, and then you can perform whatever tests you want to on that. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the mental state of the people you can you you could use, I think you mentioned th these are healthy. You call them subjects. Am I using the right term? Subjects. Participants normally. Participants. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. you were, you were using healthy participants in the in the proof of concept. Yeah. Well, we were just using any. I mean, healthy participants. I, I wonder what a healthy. I'd love to meet yeah. a healthy person. But um, yeah, it was just anyone who was coming to the retreat center, and so we didn't have any specific inclusion criteria or exclusion criteria. So if they got accepted by the retreat center, then they would be on the study. So that meant that I mean, we roughly had. 
participants with the rules of third so we had about a third of people who were coming there because they were just into alternative treatments we had a third of people who were trying to treat something and they tried everything else and ayahuasca was like their last um, their last stop no matter what that was uh, and then we also had a third of people who were just looking to expand their consciousness um, so that was kind of the rough breakdown of the participants that, that we have on the, the regular retreats but then we now do these specialist retreats like the PTSD retreats where it's everyone has to have this one diet diagnosis mm. Mm. did you what was the how did the results or are the impact compare with people who just go in there to i say just go in there to expand their mind mm. we're going to expand their mind compared to people who had some ailment did did they have a reduced effect or was it an increased effect because they weren't necessarily hoping for some kind of closure or quick fix mm. what's the, what's the difference well i guess like when we're looking at that air quote healthy participants i don't i don't i don't i can't call them healthy participants because a lot we we take their um we take their information around what diagnoses they've been diagnosed with right so a lot of people actually come say with diagnosed depression uh, anxiety adhd things like that and then for those people the what we see in the measures is that is there's generally a much bigger drastic jump just because their baseline is much higher um, compared to, but then again, sometimes people will have show up with conditions, say that they're very depressed without a diagnosis of depression, and that's just how they're feeling at that time and what they've been going through. And um, so it's really hard to be black and white about. Oh yeah, the diagnosed group are seeing more changes, but then definitely those who were who were meeting diagnostic threshold for these conditions were seeing much more drastic jumps towards the end versus someone who was kind of mentally in a better place um, on the measures that we that we have. Quite reductionist, but yeah. <laughs> how, how is your research perceived by other members of the scientific community in general? Mm. When you, you mentioned earlier about it's quite out there. Well, that's a, that's a good question. <laughs> When I when I first started working at King's College London, I found that pretty much every middle-aged male psychiatrist would come up to me and be like, you know, Simon, I once took LSD when I was in my early 20s. And I was like, okay, well, it's definitely capturing the imagination of people. Like, well, that's, that's for sure. And I think, um, you know, I think on the whole, most people have, have approached us saying, this is incredible, like, well done. Like, this is really important stuff. This is awesome. I think it's quite difficult to um, to ignore psychedelic research now because there is such a lot of research that is heavily, heavily suggesting the therapeutic potential like of these, you know, drugs like as such. But then there are people who say that the gold standard of uh, of research is in hospital based environments, um, and there are too many confounding variables, too many confounding factors when you do research in the jungle. So, for example, a common a common thing that reviewers so when you submit an academic paper it has to be reviewed by like certain reviewers and we always go back into this like to and fro where they say but how did you know it was ayahuasca it could have been the result of the community it could have been because they were in the jungle it could have been because of all the other plants they were taking and this is kind of the point like the the community is ayahuasca like being in the jungle is ayahuasca we're not we never say it's you know our findings show that ayahuasca caused this it's never it's a two-week ayahuasca retreat at this place at this time mm. caused this result and i'm definitely not saying we're definitely not saying mm. that you know the people should be taking just ayahuasca without any of this stuff this is the whole point of doing it in the shamanic container because we believe that that's the important part it's holistic it's multifactorial it's not just the drug it's not just the chemical it, that's why we love it yeah yeah i mean it's you could say you could make the same argument about people have to either visit or stay in a clinical environment for a period of time. Oh, for sure, because it's an unusual. It's unusual. Oh, I bet it's, it's less unusual than going to the jungle, right? Yeah, it's still unusual, and it still has an impact. Probably, yeah, yeah. it's probably less so, but it's still. Who's to say that that improvement oh. or whatever is because they all of a sudden had the routine being provided because they had to go in outside the hotel and, and the hotel, the hospital. For yeah, sure. So it's a it's a. And to your point, Western science. Holistic, as Wifeng yeah. said earlier. Yeah. You know, 
Western science has this tendency to try to isolate everything and just like bring everything down to see what caused what change kind of thing. And yeah, as a psychologist myself, you know, I what really fascinates me is the social aspect of it, the multifactorial, the ceremony, the ritual, the practices, the philosophies, the the cosmology of, of the whole thing that that kind of makes that that brings out the therapeutic potential. And what what really gets me is like, you know, there's this Western science kind of way of looking at something, but then these guys have been working with this for hundreds, if not thousands of years. They really know what they're doing. It's been passed down and refined through generations through trial and error, which is by, by, by definition itself is a scientific method. You know, through their own scientific method have refined this thing that made the, the preparation, the integration, the format of the ceremony to help you navigate through these really deep, deep like psychological like, and psychedelic spaces to bring out the best outcome and it survived over time because they have found it so effective. So to leave them out of the conversation when we're doing research just doesn't make any sense to me. For sure. And also randomized control trials, they're fantastic. They're nothing against randomized control trials, but they've been designed for pharmacological drugs. So they're perfect for looking at an SSRI or they're perfect for looking at, you know, another drug that's supposed to have an effect and you're checking for safety and efficacy and all of this kind of stuff. But we're seeing this more and more that people are saying psychedelics don't fit into that box. Like it's, it's like squeezing a circle into a square hole. They don't fit in there. And that's before you begin to even contemplate the notion that maybe the indigenous people know some stuff that we don't know when they're talking about psycho spiritual healing but that takes it to a whole other level yeah the rabbit hole as we mentioned <laughs> that, the rabbit hole we begin to enter the infinite rabbit hole yeah yeah and that is a that is a fascinating area to um to explore uh in terms of um i suppose one of the you know one of the queries is is what you're experiencing and feeling and perceiving real Really? Or is it not? I mean, how do you define real? Yeah. <laughs> what is real? Yeah. You know, it's like, that's for another podcast. Really. <laughs> well, in yeah, no. yeah, it's amazing. Um, uh, what was I going to say to you then? Oh, how many? So, how many indigenous communities do we know of that have ayahuasca and that ayahuasca as a core component of their? history and routine commun community there are loads what hundreds yeah i'm not sure of the effect and the exact figures but one of the one of the interesting things about it is how it's evolved over time mm -hmm. um, and how people use it in many different ways so you have people using uh, so, so we both do research and also train in the Shipibo uh, way of yeah way of working. Shipibo, Shipibo, yeah, yeah. Shipibo, and they're a community that are based uh, in the Amazon basin uh, in Peru, um, around Pacolpa um, and around Iquitos. And they, you know, they do their ceremonies at night time, um, and they're described as the spiritual surgeons, and they sing very specific medicinal chants, like they're called Icaros. And then you move to different parts of the Amazon rainforest and you have other communities uh, like the Huni Quinn who do their ceremonies uh, at, uh, during, the, during the day or around a fire and there's lots of singing, it's really happy. They're playing guitar um, and it's a completely different feeling. And then you move to, the, uh, to Brazil and you have Christian churches that are now serving ayahuasca as, to their congregation. These syncretic Christian churches, they've been around since the late 1800s, uh, kind of early 1900s, some of them and some of the later ones around the 1950s. And they combine Catholicism with ayahuasca. Um, wow. And so you have all of these different ways of working with ayahuasca. And that's before you begin to even question what actually is ayahuasca? Mm. How do you define ayahuasca? So ayahuasca, you know, technically you only need the, it's, it's comprised of the ayahuasca vine and then some leaves that contain DMT. So ayahuasca is a plant. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like a, it's a vine that grows natively throughout South America and in Hawaii. Uh, and then you have plants that contain leaves that contain DMT and you have different ones. In fact, loads of plants contain DMT and you mix them together. Am I right in saying you can get DMT on, on mushrooms? It grows as a fungi on mushrooms. It can do in the right environment. Yeah, I have. Oh, I have. I, I think that. I've heard that. What? No, well, really, a mushroom that has DMT. There's. I'm sure there was. Yeah, you can. Wow, I didn't know that. 
Unless it was something else I was given. <laughs> that you were given. No, yeah. it's, I'm sure it was DMT and you could, yeah, it will, it will appear in, uh, uh, not as a fungus, I was say it's a fungus, it appears uh, as like a white, yeah, like a white fungus on a fungus, on, on a mushroom, like oh, a white. Wow. I, I'm pretty sure. And you scrape it off and it's DMT. Because there's definitely one that you can eat together uh-huh. and it has the MRIs and the DMT in there. Like this. Okay, we're going to need to fact check yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, you definitely need to, because this was from a friend of mine in he, Swansea. He gave you some in his bedroom. Sounds legit. <laughs> <laughs> in what should be a fish tank. <laughs> <laughs> that was legit. I'm not making that yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely need to Allegedly. fact check this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. anyway, come back to that. So go on, yeah. Okay. Back, back to that stream that you were talking about. <laughs> the fish tank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, with I- the, the, the use of ayahuasca, um, because so many, there are so many people who've trained or have experienced ayahuasca with this ayahuasca boom and ayahuasca tourism that's going on. Um, and then people bringing it back to their own traditions and their own spiritual practices like Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, and all these neo shamans are kind of popping up everywhere, you know, globally. So when we're asking about the question, like, you know, how many groups are using ayahuasca as its core, you know, it's, it's, it's a really interesting question. I, I, I mean, so because it's, it's so unregulated, it's hard to do research on it, it's all underground, but it's, it's really, it's really beautiful to see how the plant culture is kind of finding his way into um into into other spiritual practices and kind of merging like for example in like chinese medicine i've definitely come across um come across ayahuasca users and practitioners in asia uh, in hong kong and uh, in, in, in taiwan you know people who has, have been studying it or have been trained in the amazon and then kind of bringing it back to their own culture and their own understanding of kind of energy and chi and and through their own practices, run the ceremonies in their own way, you know? Oh, that's interesting, because yeah. Chinese medicine yeah. tends to get a bad rap, doesn't it? Over here, I think. Over here? Yeah. We love it there. <laughs> <laughs> we love we just call it medicine. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's great, it works really well. <laughs> Plants, you know, it's more, plant, plants get a bad rub, I think, because they're not good at fighting fires, which people in the West, I think, like, are. <laughs> they really, they really want something to work fast, don't they? Mm. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, plants work really fast. Ayahuasca. Oh, Ooh. ayahuasca works really fast. Like, compared right. to, like, antidepressants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or therapy. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess, like, plants are more, like, about longevity. In, well, like, psychedelics are obviously, like, really hard hitting. But mm. most plants, when you live, like, an organic planty herbal medicine life is more about you know is preventative more than cure yeah 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 sometimes yeah, yeah. yeah. well in old in old, in old um, chinese culture when uh, like a family doctor gets fired if the family gets ill so that, like the family that should, seems quite yeah, harsh <laughs> yeah 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 that's 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 the history you know like, <laughs> I'm glad I didn't study in China. Yeah, yeah. Wow, so, was, yeah. so what was the level of unemployment like? <laughs> back, yeah. in, uh, back about three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> no doctors employed, yeah, yeah. everyone's sacked. <laughs> well, it's all about keeping you healthy. It's all about giving you, it's giving you kind of like daily medicines that you can take that are herbal um, and give, give you like a healthy, healthy life. That's that's the culture, man. Don't look at me. I mean, <laughs> that's just what happens. Yeah, it makes total sense. Yeah, but yeah. I but so is iOS go available in? I say available. Does it grow in China? Well, the MT containing plants are everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, they will have their own versions of it. Um, and then also they just need to combine it with something that's high in MAOI, uh, which is the the enzyme that the enzyme inhibitor that renders um renders ayahuasca orally active uh and then it's also yeah. an antidepressant and then that's ayahuasca so you can kind of make ayahuasca yeah and then we're going back to like what is ayahuasca <laughs> yeah <laughs> so for fun. example i also do some work um uh, with the psyche institute which are linked to the university of melbourne in australia and we've started doing randomized control trials, uh, looking at uh, what's called Aussie Wasker. Uh, so it's using Syrian rue, which contains MOAIs, and then acacia, which contains DMT. Uh, so it's making a compound like or a concoction, which is similar to ayahuasca, 
but it's, so it has the same chemical components, um, but it's from different plants. Um, yeah, and the subjective experience seems to be different in those trials and the people are having a different experience. But of course, you're also, people are receiving a capsule. It's a freeze-dried capsule, so it's plant material, but it's um, put into a capsule so it can be standardized. But then they're listening to a playlist and they're with a psychotherapist rather than um, with a shaman. So, you know, even if it was the same plants, it's arguably not ayahuasca. That's kind of, I think of it as like MRI, DMT concoctions. Mm. Um, what was the name of the community that you said you do the, the retreats with? The Shipibo. The ch that's right, yeah. Shipibo. Shipibo. Ship, Shipibo. Ship, Ship, Pibo. Ship, Pibo. Yeah, Ship Pibo. Okay. So. And they do their rituals at night. Yeah, why yeah. did you select if you selected them why did you select that community to do the retreats with I think they kind of oh, selected that's us. what you did in your research yeah. now, right? they more selected us yeah. like we um, that's what I was going to say I ended up there in 2015 um, I met somebody who was training to be a shaman in um, in Guatemala and he was on holiday from Peru and we were we just hit it off and we were kind of just talking loads about the work that he was doing and I was fascinated and he was training with the Shipibo um, and he invited me to come with him and I had my first experience drinking with the Shipibo and we're like this is incredible like what is this uh, and started looking into the research that had been done um, and found that there was very limited research scientific research in the Amazon basin uh, so we started started doing research as a result of that because there was a gap in the literature and we thought it was important I mean, we just stuck with the Shipibo um, because we, we know the Curanderos, the family that we work with really well. We've known them for the best part of 10 years now. Wafang and I both started our own um, shamanic uh, journey. So training in Shipibo and Curanderismo as well, which is, um, mm -hmm. yeah, Shipibo shamanism. In order to try and get, get a balanced view of what's going on from a scientific and a traditional perspective uh, to become better researchers, but also to be completely honest to, to see how deep that rabbit hole goes <laughs> yeah yeah uh, and I really enjoy like having a lineage like a lineage to work back on is like standing on the shoulders of giants and then you know there's all these different traditions and you, you can obviously go and go and experience them if you have the right connections and meet the right people um, but then that runs the risk of kind of really diluting when this rabbit hole here is so it's so interesting there's so much to learn from it and you know and you know we've been doing this for years now like since 2016 17 and yeah just learning more and more that we don't know anything that, that whole area is fascinating right it almost seems like another sort of unknown until this point creative civilization like there wasn't just one it's it's over there as well I mean, because you've got all that. I mean, you, you know, there's, there's a lot of focus on the minute around um, uh, ancient civilization. I mean, Graham yeah. Hancock did an awesome uh, series on Netflix. Um, what was it called? Ancient, ancient Apocalypse. Apocalypse. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah. But, you know, these discoveries in, in the Amazon, because it's, you know, it's difficult to go and find stuff there because it's not the most accessible places. And mm -hmm. It always makes you wonder what else, what other things there are, are unknown and why do they exist and why, why have these things carried on through for so long? You know, um, like like the like the uh, the ayahuasca piece, mm. there must be a, there must be a much a much richer history there than what we know of, and something we can learn so much from. Oh, for sure. I mean, only recently didn't they find like a mega city in the Amazon? Yeah, I can't wait for them to like. Yeah, that was yeah, like that, was, that was like so two amazing. weeks ago. Oh, yeah, it wasn't long, wasn't long ago, was it? Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Was yeah. A civilization yeah. in the Amazon because everything was thought to be quite nomadic. Um, they didn't know that there was going to be ancient civilization there. They, I don't think they're like proper carbon dated stuff. But then, mm. yeah, mm. I can't wait for more archaeologist research to come out of that. Yeah, it's going to be mm. amazing. Mm. Yeah, what's uh, what's next for an island? What's uh, You've obviously got the, the, the research we've just been talking about. Yeah. Like expanding those research, the scope of the genes you want to look at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we're carrying on with that. So that's an ongoing five-year study. Um, so we're just getting more and more veterans from Canada, from Australia, uh, from the UK. Veteran-focused. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. All veterans from the US. Um, and we desperately need funding for that. So if anybody's <laughs> listening and wants to fund, that would be great. And just come and find us at onaya.science. 
Um, and then we're also beginning to branch out to um, people with traumatic brain injury. And so we're looking at people who used to be um, uh, elite sports athletes. So we're teaming up with um, a UFC fighter, an MMA fighter uh, called Ian McCool. Um, and we're starting to get people who have had TBIs, traumatic brain uh, uh, injury, and then Is taking them down. No, he's from the States. States, right? Yeah, yeah. And starting to take them down to the jungle and doing a similar kind of study. So looking at people, uh, looking at them in terms of uh, neuroimaging, so looking at their brain waves with EEG, looking at them from an epigenetic point of, uh, point of view, looking at their gut microbiome, as well as their psychological changes and their cognitive changes too. So yeah, we're beginning to branch out branch out to that as well. So that's exciting. Have you looked at getting in touch with any of the rugby community here? Yes. Honest. Have you got links? Oh, you have. Have you not? Well, we've we've spoken. Sorry. Yeah, I just <laughs> so so it popped into my head. A name popped into my head. Like, okay, I got. Yeah, no, so we uh, we have thought about getting in touch with the rugby community. Actually, only I've only been in touch with the rugby some people from the rugby community in Australia. But if you had any links to people uh, in the UK, that would be great. I have, I have got a few for you. But also, also I'm sure Keith is linked in with some a Scottish next Scottish player yeah he mentioned that yeah I think he did mention that yeah yeah I'm sure he's an ambassador for heroic hearts he is he is he is we have spoken about this yeah 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 so I can get you with some English and with some Welsh but to be honest that link Keith's got will probably be better but I'm happy to try and uh, link him with some people yeah because that's because that's the TBI aspect is really gaining traction over here for the wrong reasons because people are realising I'm not very well and it's because of bangs on the head they're really really Mm. awesome players awesome human beings who are suffering because of it um yeah, that's interesting. And I mean, America's rife. They're what? In terms of TBI research and awareness, general awareness, they what? They must be five years, if not more, ahead of us. Just general populist awareness of it because of American football, I think. Yeah. And in the military, I think. Mm. Um, so there's a. I've, I've done a couple of. I've done two or three interviews with people on the subject of TBIs. Oh, really? Um, we're, one with an American guy called uh, Mark Gordon, Dr. Mark Gordon, who pioneers research and treatment of TBIs with uh, so neural and neuroendocrinological treatment yeah yeah um and he works with or has worked with a lady here in the UK called Mandy Bostwick mm. I'll connect you up with if it if it's worth connecting up with. although although I think she does have a significant uh dislike of anything that we're talking about today oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> i have just realized i think i i think i mentioned once to a uh cannabis maybe magic mushrooms and the look on her face told me it all so i i'll rethink that one yeah, yeah. <laughs> mandy is an angel though but mandy also is working on, on that side she's doing a lot of um uh, uh, trying to help a lot of ex-soldiers over here yeah. okay cool it. um yeah <laughs> yeah any yeah, of those yeah. links yeah, yeah. Great. maybe not the- mandy but there's other people i mentioned okay cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so the TBI aspect, yes, yeah, good, good interaction. It's good, yeah. you know. Like I mentioned to you off air, you know, I think the whole, I think the whole conversation around positive use of, no, not positive use, yeah, positive use of a medicinal use of psychedelics mm. and things like ayahuasca, including things like ayahuasca, mm. it's just gaining loads of traction. It's getting much more acceptable to talk about. Uh, I'll give you the example off air. You know, my youngest daughter talking about uh, pushing <laughs> pushing psychedelics in her uh, in, in a speech at school that she had to give and the school took it I reckon five years ago I say took it they allowed it to happen I think five years ago it would not have happened uh, so you want to do what you want to say uh, psychedelics are good for people's brains <laughs> yeah no you cannot say that oh, yeah. in this secondary school <laughs> yeah no, that, that was totally the case like um, when I when I and, first and the fact sorry that she was no, comfortable to do that yeah you know it's okay there's two aspects to it school said yeah and she was comfortable to do it yeah, like, yeah. it's really good yeah. well, it's changed massively like when um when i was applying for king's college london which must have been 2017 i was advised not to mention anything in my interview about researching ayahuasca and i'd actually i'd taken huge chunks of time to be in the jungle doing this scientific research peer-reviewed proper scientific research that later formed my phd which was in ayahuasca and then in the interview they were like just don't mention it so i went to the interview and then the psychiatrists were like okay simon and what were you doing between these dates in 2016 (laughs) and i had to just go Oh, nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, what? And I was like literally doing it, doing work. And then, uh, but it's amazing how quickly it changes because within about 
two years from then when I did get into Kings and there was like by the way a research ayahuasca and uh, and then the psychedelic department at Kings opened up the one at Imperial opened up and at all good universities they now have psychedelic research departments so it's isn't moving it madness quick that it didn't have those before isn't yeah. it madness yeah. it didn't have yeah, 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 yeah. you know regardless of what you, you know what you think about the substances the drugs they, I, in my mind I think well they obviously have a big impact Mm. Why would you not want to research that? Yeah, you know, it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just madness. To me. Well, there are many reasons, mm. like most of them political. political. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I had a very similar experience as well for my interview with Kings. Did you? Yeah, 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 yeah. And just kind of like, yeah, for for my for for signing up, just like had to like leave out all of these papers and then not say anything in the thing. But when they get in, but yeah, I'm just thinking actually now. I now I work at the Morsley one day a week at, in this team that have basically downsized in the space because the psychedelic department have grown so much and they're like a really like they're a really established team but even even those guys have been <laughs> have been just kind of just like budged to like a corner somewhere because <laughs> because especially the um, yeah the psychedelic trials group at kings have really grown exponentially mm. like working with a lot of collaborators a lot of different projects going on really big team now mm. yeah mm. in a matter of years has been changed so how can people find out keep track of what you guys are doing and, and learn from it. Yeah, so you can go to our website. So we have our website, onaya.science, which is O-N-A-Y-A dot science. Onaya actually is a Shipibo word, which means sorcerer for the power of good. But it's used, <laughs> use, <laughs> use, more, it. use more colloquially to mean kind of healer or doctor. Um, yeah, so on IS Science, you can go to our website uh, or on, you can follow us on Twitter or Instagram or any kind of social media. We're on there too. And then we also have these new exciting projects coming up where we're doing designing preparation, integration and ceremonial navigation programs, um, as well as actually beginning to train people as well uh, in psychology, psychiatry, uh, spirituality and shamanism. So it's mixing all of these things together to really have a holistic view um, on what we're doing so you can become one of our Onaya specially trained therapists. So what well, that's a course? Yeah, yeah. So there are many different things. So there are courses that you can do if you're going to be going uh, and doing a psychedelic experience yourself uh, and that will help prepare you uh, and to integrate you and also help you to be able to navigate through that experience and it draws from our expertise on uh, psychology and shamanism and we're also designing it with the current arrows and the shamans that we work with um, so it's this kind of holistic way of looking at it and then we're also we're looking to hopefully quite soon to start training our own onaya therapists and they're people who would have dual training so if you have a background in psychology or therapy uh, or, yeah or anything like that or an interest in that and how that intersects with shamanism and spirituality uh, then you can go to onaya.io uh, this space yeah uh, and you can see our, our new courses and programs that will be available there that sounds pretty cool yeah it's a big old project though big old project yeah yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> how are you feeling about all that effort have you put it all together already just waiting to launch it we put together the courses um, yeah. and we're just starting to put together the training programs mm. yeah yeah that sounds pretty cool yeah, mm. have we um what have we not covered that we want to cover I love that we just left that right. <laughs> it's such a big part of what we do. It's like the other half of Anaya. Yeah. Um, yeah. But nobody knows about it yet because we haven't launched it. We haven't launched it. We haven't yet. launched it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you launch it? Probably in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. soon. <coughs> really? Yeah, soon. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Anaya.io. I'll put that link in the, uh, awesome. in the bio and, yeah, for yeah. The, uh, and for the website as well. Yeah. And then um, where are you? So, so funding wise if people want to get involved and and sponsor support anything mm. you're doing is that information on the website as well yes. yeah that's all on onaya.science so it's worth mentioning that for the research we're completely not for profit um, which means that we completely 100 percent rely on donations and that's what allows us to carry on um, and not being involved with pharma being completely independent so yeah, we, we do desperately need funding, always. Um, so if there is anybody who is able to give anything, no matter how small, please do get in touch. Please and cool. thank yous. Cool. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Really, As always. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, enjoyed nice. it. I'm, I'm much more knowledgeable on the subject of ayahuasca Good. For, uh, for, for, for the effort of you guys. And let's, uh, let's do it again and chat about 
Oh, yeah, these courses will be launched. Let's give them maybe a year's time or less and see how, how things are progressing. Yeah, absolutely. We'd like to. That would be great. Thanks a lot, Hugh. Cheers. Yes, thank you, Hugh.